don't know if you guys remember um, when when did I preach the last Sunday night? Was it at the beginning of December? Or the second second Sunday? Anyways, it doesn't matter. But it's been a little little while. Uh, you remember what uh, the message was on at the beginning of Jude? Was the first couple of verses of Jude? Well, I, I didn't want to just before I get into uh, moving on. I just wanted to, to reiterate a little bit. Um, kind of talked about the legacy that Jude left. The legacy of of here's a man who is the brother of our Lord Jesus Christ, and yet in instead of calling himself brother of Christ, he called himself a servant of Jesus Christ. When Jude could have bragged that he was the brother, he said he was a servant. Which is an example that we should follow. We're not, we're not brothers, but we should be servants. That should be our goal, servants of Christ. We also saw in verse 1 that this is a message to the saved, uh, to the elect of God. Uh, to those who are called is what it says. Um, I find this as a, as a common theme throughout the scriptures, uh, especially the epistles from Paul um, and uh, the, the other epistles in the New Testament, that there are many passages, not all of them, but there are many passages that are very explicit that start off by saying that this is a message to the believers, to the church. I do think it is important for us to recognize uh, that fact because it can have a, a big impact on our interpretation of the scripture. So, uh, I just wanted to, to kind of go over that again. Um, we actually kind of talked about that some tonight even with our, our Baptist confessional uh, that this is for the church, not necessarily for the lost. So. We have a lot of messages there for the church. But uh, so tonight I'm going to be preaching from Jude, uh, the third verse, and some of the fourth verse. So if you're not already there, please turn there. And we'll read. Beloved, Although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray that, is, uh, that tonight that just keep us focused on your word and your truth and your glory. I pray that you would speak through me and that you would move on those listening to me, that they would hear uh, your word and not mine. Let's pray this for your glory. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. So the very first word, hey. 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 You get, to, you get to hear the very first word of verse 3. We're in Jude. Starting in verse 3. The very first word is beloved. Actually, this is in, in Greek, this is agapetos. Um, this word is actually found about 61 times 
in the New Testament, frequently used by Paul and John, very rarely used at the beginning of a letter, only, I believe, 3 John, John, I'd have to look at it again, 3 John, I think, but again, just as in, in the first verse, Jude is making, is, is distinguishing those who are of God, the beloved, and, and these are beloved both of God and of the saints uh, of, of the church. Those distinguishing between those people um, and those who are wicked or who are not of God. And I think, and I've read a lot of commentaries about um, why he starts this way. Um, and most of them talk about his wanting to get to the point right away. His subject is important. He doesn't want to beat around the bush. No time for small talk or long greetings. There's a very important message that he wants to deliver, so he's going to get right to it. Um, I have, I, I agree with that, but I think there's there's more to it than that. In his in his greeting in verse two, he had said, "May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you," and now he says, "Beloved." Um, in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, many of you may know this without turning to it. It says, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. So it's important for us to encourage one another and to entreat each other in love, especially when there's this harsh word, this hard word of warning that's going to be following after. Jared um, has talked about this in Malachi, of the way God addressed his people, uh, the Israelites. That he starts off by showing his love for them, that he, he loves them. And he has a very stern message for them in Malachi. Did you say it's a lie? But he's not giving this message in hatred of them. He's giving this message in love for them. And this is the same way that Jude is addressing the church. Is, is he's, he's addressing them in love. And this is the, the same example. We can, we can look at Jude's example here in how... He is addressing an issue in the church. Sometimes we can begin to feel, if we see somebody else sinning, we can be, begin to feel some pride and a little self-righteousness, and we can uh, hammer at people, and, or we could become angry, hammer at them, and they don't feel or see any love uh, in, in what we're doing. But, but that's not... Uh, that's not the way it should be. So when we see sin creeping into a brother or sister or, or the, someone that we know from the church into their lives, should we ignore that sin? No, we should not. But should we blast away at them without any regard to their feelings? Yes, Scott, we should. All right, I'll remember that when I'm talking to you. But that's also a no. Right, really? I got a little from him. Go ahead. I'm well, you want to read? You want to? You want to read? Read something for me? Galatians six one. I can read it if you don't want to. Yeah, go ahead. It says, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression. You who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness and keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. But a spirit of gentleness. 
God of harshness, gentleness, God. Mm -hmm. Depends on how someone defines gentleness. It's whatever is effective. When you say tough love, there needs to be love there. Second Timothy 4.2 says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. So I, I like the way that Jude opens this letter with, with this term, beloved, this encouragement to the church. Um, and this is what he's about to do is some reproving, some rebuking, some teaching, some exhorting. See, Jude sees a problem in the church and that it needs to be corrected right now. This is not something that can wait. So he starts off by telling his audience, which, again, is all believers, that they are loved. So next, we see Jude's motivation in writing this letter. The specific motivation. He loves the church. But, in addition, we see here, it says that he, he says he was eager to write to them about, he says, our common salvation. So what he wanted to do was he wanted to share with his fellow believers about all the great and marvelous things God had done to talk about the saving work of Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. But, and, and, and we don't know because Jude doesn't say, but Jude either through his own uh, some, what, what he had seen himself or what somebody had informed him of was a movement and it must have been successful to at least some extent because he put aside what his plans were to give that message that God wanted his people to hear. So God God, of course, knew about the heresy spreading in his church. And he saw fit to use Jude to expose it. So, I've got a question. <coughs> Would it have been wrong for Jude to write that letter concerning our common salvation? Is it wrong to do good things if God has not called us to do them. No. To do what is good is to do what is God's will. You can go be a missionary, but if he's called you to be a janitor... Let me rephrase. If God has... It, is it wrong to do things that everyone around us would perceive as good if God has not called us to do them? That's Proverbs 19.21, let's look there. It says, many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Jude had a plan of what he wanted to do. I don't know if Jude wanted to have to address this problem. I don't know that he really wanted this problem to exist so that it would need addressing. He wanted to talk about the things that were joyful to him. But God had a purpose for Jude and for this letter that he would write. So, I also want to look at this phrase, common salvation. We'll get back to 
to a God's plan and purpose. But in this phrase, common salvation, it tells us something else. Um, those who had been infiltrating the church uh, with these false ideas were in many cases, um, we've talked about this in our church history class, we've talked about this in, at any time when we're talking about early church history, um, we talk about the, the Gnostics. Um, these Gnostics claimed to have some special knowledge. And Jude is saying here that this is a salvation, this common salvation, is shared by all of God's elect. It is common to all believers, not just to the, to the apostles or to some special few. So we see that there in his use of the term common salvation. I'm not happy. I made, I printed, there's some words that printer. I had some text in red and I forgot that that printer doesn't print red. So I'm doing my best here because it's not printing anything. Um, so because of this threat to the church, Jude had to write about a subject that he really would rather wasn't needed. But when we some, see something that is wrong, Jude knew that it is our obligation to point it out. So I want to look at Psalm 94, 16. And I'm glad I wrote the, uh, I have my uh, <coughs> reference in, in black ink instead of red ink. It says, who rises up for me against the wicked? Who stands up for me against evildoers? And again, we're going to turn now turn to Ezekiel chapter 3. We'll look at verses 18 and 19. It says, If I say to the wicked, you shall surely die. And you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way in order to save his life. That wicked person shall die for his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die for his iniquity that you will have delivered your soul. We need to point out the things that we see that are wrong, that are against God's truth. We must stand for God in all things. This includes all these areas today in the world that we see going on around us. So many churches we see in the world today, even in our local community. When God says, who will stand for me? They answer, not us. Because when society changes, when the culture shifts, they shift right along with them. They do not stand for God. They 
may at one time have seen it as evil, but they thought it was easier, was more pleasant just to go along to get along. And now maybe they have lost sight of even what is evil, even what is true. They refuse to take a stand. So when God asks you through his word that, that passage in Psalm, who will rise up for me against the wicked? And who will stand for me against those who practice iniquity? Will it be us? Will it be you? So if you love him and you follow him, then it should be you. And if you love him and you follow him, then I think you, it will be you. So this is what Jude is doing. He's given up his own plans, his own desires. To do what God, to, to follow God's plan. So what was... Jude standing up for? What was he contending for? And it says here that it was the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Now Jude, the book of Jude uh, was thought to have been written around 67 AD. Uh, not long after the resurrection of Christ. And what we see here is that the doctrines that we see taught in Scripture were not something that were even brand new when they were written down by Paul or John or Jude or James or any of the New Testament writers. They weren't brand new then. These were doctrines that had already been set in stone. Not something that changes, not something that evolves. Scripture tells us that God doesn't change, that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His truth does not change. His truth lasts forever. This faith that Jude is contending for. It's the same as what we see in 2 Timothy 1.14 at the deposit that was entrusted to you that Paul said to Timothy, that Paul told him to guard. This is that deposit that was entrusted to him. The truth from God. This is the truth of God's word that is given to all Christians. It is not something vague or undefined, but it is a solid core upon, upon which our faith is built. Now there are many today that speak of the church changing in its doctrine in the centuries after the resurrection. Um, as, as I had been studying for our church history class, um, I read a lot of stuff online people's opinions about the church. So many uh, theories. The divinity of Christ, for example. That it was created. That it wasn't something that, that uh, was believed by the earliest church, but it was something that was created at the Council of Nicaea. Something they just came up with. Oh, I think that would be a good idea. Let's do that. But is, is that true? Obviously, obviously not. I can tell you right now that although those doctrines may have been written down as a creed, or explained 
in more detail by some early church father. It is the same exact doctrine and faith that was taught by our Lord Jesus Christ himself during his earthly ministry. I'm not saying that everything any church father said was, was that, but this faith that was once for all delivered to the saints that we're talking about here. This is not something that changes. And it is that faith that we must defend. We've talked a lot about it on Wednesday nights, uh, even during Sunday school. Jim has spoken of it on Sunday mornings. The importance of sound doctrine. And not a doctrine that we've created here at Lighthouse but God's doctrine. This is a faith that was given to us by God and that He commands us to defend. We need to stand up today for, our, for this unchanging faith. You know, I, I see in uh, my political experience, we talk about the Constitution. I'm what you might call an originalist. Uh, I believe that we interpret the Constitution based on the, the people who wrote it, what they, how they intended it to be interpreted. And so, we say this is what the Constitution means. It means exactly what they wanted it to mean. It doesn't mean anything new. It is not a living document in the sense that it changes over time based on the changes in society. Well, Scripture is like that. When we look at Scripture, we cannot allow our society and our culture to influence how we read the scripture and how we understand and interpret the scripture. We cannot fall into this trap and say that we need to adapt our faith to fit the context of this world. So what do we do if the context doesn't match what God has revealed through His Word. We change the context. We change ourselves. We change what's around us. Because God's Word is true, not man's Word. Um, I'm going to go into verse 4 just briefly. Um, but I'm not going to get through very much of it. said, For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. I was telling Jared, I, I was, had read a number of, well, when, when I was studying this, I, I thought to myself, and this is another place where everywhere now that I look in Scripture, I see the doctrines of grace, I see the sovereignty of God. I see these things everywhere I read. And, and I see this again here. This is not necessarily talking about election unto salvation in this verse, but those who long ago were designated for this condemnation. And I read a, a commentary, I think, I think the guy's name is Ellicott. You ever read any of his stuff, Ellicott? Uh, yeah, he, uh, he had something interesting to, stay, to say about this verse. He said, 
he said many Calvinists point to this verse to talk about the sovereignty of God, but it has nothing to do with that, which I find kind of interesting. So I decided to look at what uh, what these words mean. We're talking about designated. Long ago, were designated for this condemnation. So what what could that mean? Well, it could mean that at some point recently and within Jude's lifetime, somehow it had been written down that these men were going to uh, come into the church, these specific people, and had been infiltrating the church. That's not very likely. That doesn't really sound... That does, certainly does not fit long ago um, or designated, because who would designate them? If this was not talking about something God did. The other suggestion was that this, that they were not designated for all, for all time, or that uh, uh, in eternity past, but this was the fulfillment of some Old Testament prophecy. But even if it didn't give a spe specific suggestion of what the Old Testament prophecy might be, but just something that was that was written down. This is not something that God God declared in eternity past that this was going to happen this way. You know, I don't think that any prophecy that was written down in the Old Testament is something that uh, that that God didn't declare in eternity past. So even if that's what it was, it wouldn't change the fact that this, this shows the sovereignty of God in election. Um, so I just wanted to mention that it doesn't really fit with uh, what I want to talk about for verse 4 exactly, but I thought it was uh, it was pertinent for me that we talk about studying scripture and studying all of scripture um, and I just I, I find it fascinating now that that uh, you know as I as I study scripture and as God reveals more uh, of the truth to me that uh, I can't I can't hardly read uh, more than a few verses without seeing some evidence of God's sovereignty thought that I would uh, share that. Um, so we're going to, uh, I'm going to pick up in verse 4 next time. But some things that we need to remember. We need to remember how important it is to expose evil. We need to remember how important it is to bring those things into the light which are in darkness. And it doesn't matter uh, what happens to us. This passage that, that we read in Ezekiel, in verse 18, where it says, That if you do not give this warning, then this person, this wicked person, will dies in their iniquity, and their blood is on our hands. We cannot stand by and watch it happen. Say that that we're we're going to be separate and apart from all of this. Because when we see this going on in the church, not necessarily in the world, 
because we know that the world is corrupt. We know that the world is wicked. But the church, those who profess a belief in Jesus Christ, they should be following God's teachings. They should be following what the Scripture says. They should be following the truth. And it is our It is our calling. It is, it is our requirement to point out those things in love to our fellow believers when we see these errors and to stand up for God. So when he asks, who will stand for me? We should be the first to answer, I will stand for you. And so next time we'll get back into June. that you would just instill within us a desire to know your word, to know your, your scripture, to know the truth that you set down once and for all, that you provided for us as a, a solid foundation for our faith. These doctrines that do not change. And Lord, I pray that you would show us, that you would point out to us any errors in our own beliefs. because it is our desire to know the truth and to follow you and to serve you in the way that you would have us to serve you. It is our desire to glorify you in all things. Just Thank you for this time that we have to, to study your word and to pray and to, to hear the, the message from your scripture, Lord, to hear your truth proclaimed, Lord, and I pray that uh, it would, would be proclaimed throughout this country and throughout this world and that your church would stand for you. Let me just give you a